Now, Marx also talks about the alienation. And what are people alienated from? Alien, what are they estranged from? They alienated from nature. And look at alienation from nature. We're so alienated from nature that we're destroying it. Alienated from their work so that their work has no meaning for them. Alienated from their humanity, their sense of themselves as humans. And alienated from their fellow human beings. Now, in that context of alienation, which capitalism imposes on people, in ways I'll talk about in a minute, you have massive emotional isolation of people. So that we have this society in which many people are isolated. They're stressed, for the reasons I've already mentioned, because of loss of control, uncertainty, lack of information, and they're isolated. Well, yeah, you're going to get a lot of disease. You're going to get a lot of disease of the physical sort that will kill you, like cancer and multiple sclerosis and so on. And hear more from Dr. Gabor Mate. I don't know about the United States figures, but in Canada, in the 1940s, the gender ratio of multiple sclerosis, man-to-man, man-to-woman ratio was one-to-one. You know what the ratio now is? And I'm sure the same statistics would obtain in the U.S. as well. It's three or four women for every man. Now, as soon as we know that, we know a couple of things. It can't be genetic. Genes don't change over 40, 50 years. Can't be the climate, because that hasn't changed more for one gender or the other. Can't be the diet. What is it? It's stress. And why are women more stressed now than used to be? Because they're still playing the role that they always did of being the emotional stress absorbers of their environments. They absorb the stresses of their men. That's why married men live longer than unmarried men. But unmarried women, but, uh, but married women don't live longer than unmarried women. <laughs> Just a fact. So they're still doing that automatic, culturally appointed role of the stress absorbers, plus they have an economic role to play. And they're doing so in the context of less support. Why is there less support? Because capitalism destroys contact and, commu- and, 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 and connection. It has destroyed the clan, the tribe, the extended family, the community, the neighborhood. See, human beings never used to live the way we live now. In fact, if you look at a clock, and it's an hour-long clock, the the, the time in which we live the way way we're living now is maybe one minute out of that, those 60, maybe less. Because we used to live in community, connection. And that was the context for child-rearing. So children used to have many adults to to relate to as they were growing up, and people had each other to relate to. We don't have that anymore. Every time Walmart puts up another uh, outlet in some small town, what do you think happens? You you, You get to save 10 cents on a bag of nails. But what else happens? A lot of people go to work not minimum wage. People with independent small businesses have to shut down because they can't compete. Those are the economic consequences. What are the human consequences? Is that communities are drained of life. Because the local stores close, the local restaurants close. The, the, the community is, um, the, the, the infrastructure of the community is completely destroyed. And we all get to save a bit of money on, on what we buy. Well, these aren't, these diseases aren't separable from the environment. Now when it comes to addiction and specifically, uh, in the downtown east side of Vancouver, I never had a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child. And as were many of the men. And so it's always, the heart of addiction is always emotional loss. And the obvious ones are those losses incurred by those adverse childhood experiences identified in this California study. Incidentally, there's an epidemic of obesity in this country. The adverse childhood experiences studies began at an obesity clinic because the doctors working there in San Diego actually found that they could help people lose weight, but they couldn't help people keep it off. And then Dr. Felitti in San Diego did something extraordinary for a medical doctor. He began to listen to his patients and he he found one history of trauma after another. People were eating to soothe themselves because the junk foods release the feel-good chemicals in the brain. 
so that the obesity epidemic in this country is actually a bit of, uh, an epidemic of stress and emotional loss is what it actually is. And exhorting people to eat well is not going to make any bit of good. As long as you're stressing people the way people are being stressed right now, they're going to keep eating exactly the way they're eating. But there's another side to it as well. Not everybody who becomes addicted was traumatized in those ways. What else is happening? Because if you look at what's happening with this burgeoning number of children being diagnosed with this or that disorder, not all of them were abused. Many of them were not. But what's going on? Well, as D.W. Winnicott, the great British child psychiatrist, pointed out, there's two things that can go wrong in childhood. First of all, when things, go, things happen that shouldn't happen, and that's the abuse and the trauma. And secondly, when things don't happen that should happen. And that's the presence of non-stressed, non-depressed, emotionally attuned, available caregivers. That's not available in a country where the average maternity leave is six and a half weeks. That's not available where kids spend most of the time away from the nurturing adults in their lives in the company of other kids so that they're forced to look to each other as their attachment figures. The texting and the emailing and the twittering that's going on. The desperation of kids to always connect. The sense of disorientation they feel when they can't connect with their friends by some electronic means. It's not a technological problem. It's an attachment problem. Those people, those kids have been disconnected from the adults in their lives because the adults are not there for them. They can't be. They're too stressed. And there was a study a few weeks ago that showed that stressed parents, not unloving parents, but stressed parents simply are not as attuned to the emotional cues of their kids as they'd like to be. And that's what the, the psychologist formerly at UCLA, Alan Shore, calls proximal separation. Proximal separation is when the parent is physically there, but emotionally unavailable because they're too stressed and too distracted. And that's what my children experienced when they were small because I was a workaholic physician. And this society rewards workaholism. They tell you what a great guy you are. They reward you for the very things that undermine the health of your family. And for a lot of people, it's not even a question of a choice. When under the sainted and behaloed Bill Clinton, the, uh, the welfare laws were changed so that mothers could have only a number of years on welfare, then they had to go to work. Now, where exactly does a single welfare mother go to work? Well, usually at a low-paying job far away from home where she has to commute for an hour or two. And all that time that she's working and all that time that she's commuting, her child is in some daycare, inadequately staffed, with undertrained uh, personnel. Well, what is that, who does that kid got to connect to then? The other kids. And the children become each other's uh, uh, connection uh, foci. And that means that for the first time in history, you have large numbers of kids, immature creatures, getting their modeling and their cue giving and their sense of direction and sense of values and how to walk and how to talk from other immature creatures. But what do you expect in that culture but all kinds of dysfunction? And again, that's not an individual choice that parents have made. That's just another way in which this system has undermined the necessary conditions for child development. 